than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and All right, we are starting the last day of the lecture. All right, yeah, thanks, thanks. So uh, yeah, today is the last day. Uh, we still still start with a little bit administrative stuff. Um, the first is that um, the last homework, homework five, is going to uh, due tomorrow, and the uh, final project, right, project four, that's going to due on Sunday. I mean, again, it's the uh, same as any other project. And the, uh, we'll still be holding uh, the additional office hour uh, on Saturday. Again, um, just please try to do as much you, as you can in these few days. But you have some uh, last few uh, issues that you cannot resolve, then you probably can check out the office hour on Saturday. Right? <laughs> you don't really. I mean, you, even though we allow the uh, you use the grace day on the final week, I mean, typically you might be want want to uh, uh, focus on your exams in the final week. And then again for the uh, final exam. Um, it will be on Friday, on December the 10th. It will be uh, 8.30 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and then, th th importantly, it's actually in a different place, right? It's in uh, Doherty Hall at 2210. So just uh, don't <laughs> just uh, habitually uh, come to uh, this uh, place at, in the morning and then figure out it's not a correct place. And again, uh, we'll be uh, using uh, the test of the exam paper similarly as a scantron. So uh, please bring uh, rubber and a pencil so that if you uh, figure out that you want to change your answer, then you can easily do that. Otherwise, if you just uh, mark the exam paper all over the place, it's not e very easy for us to grade and to grade it correctly, right? So uh, please uh, make sure you, you, you bring that. So uh, again, a little bit additional things <laughs> on the uh, final exam. So like, I, like we clarified on Piazza, the exam would be uh, focusing on all the materials after the midterm. So the questions will be based on materials. It will be, all, will, all, will be uh, evaluating your understanding of the topics after the midterm. Uh, but as I said, the questions, I mean, in order to uh, understand what the question is asking, you may need uh, understanding of earlier uh, lecture material as well, right? For example, if we are asking you a question about logging and recovery, then you need to know what a buffer pool is, right? What a buffer pool is doing and what does it mean by flushing a dirty page onto the, onto the disk, right? So those, those are all the concepts that discussed earlier in the semester as well as in our first project. We'll not be testing how to flush flush a buffer page uh, in the final exam, but you need to understand that to be able to uh, answer the questions related to logging and recovery, right, as an example. Again, it will be um, open book, open notes, and uh, open calculator. So essentially all the paper-based material will be allowed, uh, but for the electronic device, I mean, only a uh, calculator is allowed, right? And uh, lastly, we'll be uh, post an announcement on Piada with the uh, practice exam, so you can check out, okay? So a uh, uh, little bit more administration stuff. Uh, you can you probably already received the email about the course evaluation. Right? It will be an evaluation for both uh, me and Andrew as the uh, instructors or faculties, as well as the evaluation on the TAs. Right? We will appreciate uh, any feedback. And, and please, uh, please give honest feedback. Don't I mean, worry to uh, offend us, us or anything. Right? Please give your uh, honest feedback so either uh, Andrew, I, or the TAs uh, could improve, right? Could be the feedbacks would inc could include both on um, the homeworks, the projects, I mean, the reading materials, as well as the lectures, right? Any feedback would be appreciated, all right? <laughs> so any questions about the administrative stuff before we uh, do our final review? Okay, cool. So uh, if there's no question, we'll just be uh, I mean, doing a very, a fairly quick final review today. So today's lecture would, uh, We'll probably be uh, rather like we can probably finish it in like 20 minutes or so, right? Just like a quick review of uh, what we we have covered uh, in the second half of the semester and what we'll be focusing on in the final exam, essentially. Right? <laughs> so uh, first of all, of all, I mean, like I mentioned, the exam would not be uh, focusing on earlier materials, right? And will not really test um, your understanding of them. But I mean, you you still need to understand those topics to be able to uh, understand what you are asking uh, in the in the exam, right? Especially uh, for the uh, topics related to logging, right? So uh, in the earlier semester, we covered I mean basic SQL query, we covered buffer pool, we covered hash table, bpass tree, I mean different storage model, row format, column format, as well as like you can execute query uh, in parallel, right? For example, I mean just uh, for hash table, we are not going to ask you guys, hey. 
uh, what will be the extendable hashing algorithm or linear hashing algorithm, how to implement that. We will not be asking you guys about those things, but you, you need to understand, I mean, the, the, what's the purpose of a hashing table, hash table, right? What the functionality it provides can be used in joins and as an index, and then how, how does, what's the, uh, what is uh, purpose in the context of a larger database system, right? So you need to uh, re still remember those uh, high level uh, concepts. Okay, so for the detailed stuff we uh, covered uh, in the uh, second half of semester after midterm. So first, we spend the two lectures on query optimization. I right? talk about how you come up with a uh, efficient or semi-optimal query plan that can execute the query uh, in the uh, potentially uh, in a potentially efficient way. Right. So we <laughs> we talk about a few um, elements in this query optimization. The first, there are a few uh, heuristic algorithms. Right? I mean, you can just uh, rewrite or like uh, tweak this uh, plan structure a little bit using uh, heuristic rules. Right? For example, we talk about a predicate pushdown. I mean, essentially, you can uh, split the predicates in the where clause of a query, right? and then push a specific predicate as close, I mean, as possible to uh, when you uh, scan the table. Right? Essentially, to put a push a predicate down to the uh, lower level of the query plan tree. Right? Try to filter as many tuples. Uh, as early as possible. And the second we talk about uh, projection pushdown is a little bit similar uh, concepts, right? You want to, if the query has a projection, there are certain columns that you, the query does not really need you to return the results, then you essentially you can do the projection early, right? as low as possible, so that you can I mean, reduce the uh, number of columns that you eventually uh, return, I mean, as much as possible, as early as possible. And, and third, for example, we also talk about uh, different techniques to optimize nested subqueries, right? Essentially, we talk about either either a rewrite the nested query uh, into a join query, as well as you can decompose nested query, right? Essentially, try to um, lift the uh, the nested query or the subquery up uh, into a separate query and write that to the write the result to a temporary table, uh, so that you don't have to uh, re-execute this particular subquery over and over again, right? Okay, so these are the uh, a few uh, basic heuristic rules that we can apply when we're trying to optimize a query, and then in order to um, try to figure out a, uh, a, a even more efficient query plan, we talk about we first talk about uh, different statistics that would be helping us in, in the search for a better query plan. Uh, we talk about how do we use these uh, simple uh, methods as well as some concepts in uh, like basic mathematics and statistics to uh, estimate the cardinalities, right? Whether uh, we have a we have a one one predicate or multiple predicate, whether it's conjunction, discon disjunction, etc. Right? We talk about how do we handle those cases uh, in terms of kinetic estimation. And we also uh, talk a little bit, focus a little bit on histograms, right? which would be a very common approach in database that would help us to estimate the kinetics uh, when we are trying to optimize queries. And lastly, we talk a little bit about the uh, final the cost-based search framework, essentially dynamic programming. Right, uh, trying to use this uh, memorized uh, search process, uh, figure out what would be the uh, best order to uh, join different tables and arrange this uh, query plan structure. So these are the concepts that uh, we covered in the uh, query optimization. All right. Next, uh, transactions. We we actually spend a fairly uh, a few uh, like part. Quite, a, quite some amount of time on transactions in this course, right? Essentially, we have uh, four lectures on that. So it's like it would be a, a very important concept uh, covered in this class. And um, the first, we talk about the very uh, basic uh, property or concept of assay, right? which would be the, uh, like, uh, arguably the fundamental uh, property that the heavy system can provide to the programmers, right? To make uh, their, uh, to make their life easier to develop their application and focus on their business logic, right? So as I said, it would be uh, automaticity, consistency, isolation, and durability, right? You have to uh, remember what they are and what they are trying to do, how they are going to help uh, the programmers to access and manage data, right? And then, and beyond that, we first, at a, from a theoretical analysis level, right, we talk about a different serializability concept, right, that include conflict serializability would be like used uh, more common, as well as a view serializability. I mean, it's, 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 in practice, view serializability is rarely used, but you still need to understand I mean, the concept of it and how to check those serializability and how, generally, in general, how to ensure those serializability, right? Uh, in, the, in the following lecture, we also talk about this concept of recoverable schedules, right? 
uh, that's also an important type of um, scheduling uh, that a system would, would, would look at when they are trying to um, I mean, guarantee the transaction uh, correctness. And then we also talk about the uh, concepts of different isolation levels, right? And different uh, anomaly patterns. So, I mean, with different isolation levels, the system would potentially have a different I mean, efficiency in terms of guarantee the I mean, concurrency and, or consistency and isolate, isolation property. But at the meantime, I mean, different isolation level will also allow different anomalies, right? So it depends on what the requirement the system or the application would want uh, compared to the what efficiency that the system can provide in terms of um, implementing the concurrency control protocol, all right? The next, uh, we also talk about, we spend one particular lecture talk, of, talk about this like a pessimistic concurrency control uh, method, uh, we're essentially based on locking. And we, we, I mean, we focus on this algorithm called two-phase locking, right, which is the uh, most commonly used uh, pessimistic concurrency control protocol. And then we talk about the distinction between a rigorous uh, concurrency, I mean, two, sorry, rigorous two-phase locking, in other words, the uh, strong, strict two-phase locking, versus the like, original version of non-rigorous, right, the basic version of uh, two-phase locking, what the difference between them and what different properties uh, they can provide. And second, we also talk about uh, different uh, methods to, uh, pre to deal with the deadlock situation. Right? Essentially, there is a deadlock detection as deadlock uh, prevention. There are different uh, uh, design decisions they could make, either a one wait or wait die, right? different uh, trade-offs. So um, these, those are the things we uh, discuss there. And lastly, we talk about this concept of uh, multiple uh, granularity locking, essentially these uh, intention locks. right? So uh, if, I mean, a uh, query is trying to uh, scan the entire tuple, sorry, entire table, then it would be very costly and sort of a waste of effort if you try to lock every single tuple in the table, for example, if the table can have a billion rows, right? So in this case, you can have an intention lock at a higher level uh, of, this, uh, of this database. For example, you can have a read lock on the entire table, then you can just uh, read everything in, in the table with only one lock, right? But of course, with a higher level locking, you, you essentially uh, restrict the parallelism and the concurrency that is allowed in the system, right? So potentially, there's a efficiency cost and uh, uh, you have to balance uh, those uh, two different uh, scenarios, all right? Next, we uh, spend a few lectures and talk about a more optimistic, uh, one, essentially uh, one or two lectures, talk about this uh, optimistic uh, approach in ter uh, to implement concurrency control protocol. We first talk about this like a basic timestamp ordering uh, concurrency, concurrency control mechanism, right? and also we talk about this uh, optimization you can do to make the, uh, to essentially allow uh, more scheduling of transactions, right? Potentially allow more parallelism called the Thomas Wright rule, right? So you can overwrite a, a earlier transaction if the, so you can, one transaction can overwrite the uh, write of the earlier transaction if that transaction never read it, right? So essentially you can uh, do this uh, write optimization. And then we uh, spend um, uh, a lecture to talk about this optimistic concurrency control protocol. So it's, it's a one, protocol, specific protocol, but it also belongs to the category of optimistic concurrency control, right? So just a, it's a little bit confusing. The naming is not ideal, but you have to be able to distinguish uh, or identify those concepts, right? So in this specific optimistic concurrency control protocol, right, a specific implementation, there will be uh, three phases, a read phase, validation phase, and, and write phase, right? And in validation phase, we talk about a different, again, different design decisions uh, here, essentially of either forward validation or backward validation, right? different choices you can do to implement this uh, protocol. Lastly, we talk about <laughs> this multi-version concurrency control. And again, for this multi-version concurrency control, it's not a specific protocol, right? For it, 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 it has a similar name with other protocols, but multi-version concurrency control is in fact an optimization that you can apply on either like timestamp ordering, optimistic, or even two-phase lock and concurrency control, right? It's a optimization, but not a specific uh, concurrency control protocol. And uh, it's actually uh, widely used in uh, most of the systems, right? especially modern systems. And there are different uh, different uh, design decisions there as well, right? Different policies. Uh, first, we talk about uh, version storage, right? Whether you store the entire tuple, only a delta version of the tuple, where do you store that? Uh, and different version records. And then we talk about the ordering, right? 
how do you order this like variant chain of different variants of this tuple, either oldest to newest or newest to oldest, etc. Right? And we also talk about different garbage collection mechanism, either uh, transaction level or uh, like tuple level, etc. All right. So uh, that's that. Any uh, questions so far on this query optimization and the concurrency control? Okay. Then we uh, spend. <laughs> A, uh, a few lectures talk about um, logging and recovery. Uh, this is also a very, very uh, important concept in the database system to guarantee especially uh, the uh, durability and consi sometimes consistency aspect, but especially the durability aspect, right? <laughs> uh, it, 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 well, it helps the autom uh, automicity as well, right? So like a very, very important concept in the database systems. And to begin with, right, we talk about this uh, very, again, very important definition of a stale and a false policies, right? Those, I mean, two uh, different uh, choices on um, different types of policies will actually uh, determine many of the uh, later on, I mean, optimizations on implementations of crash and recovery because, I mean, depending on whether you have, you allow stale, no stale, false or no false, that just determines what the later algorithms can do and, and cannot do, right? Those are like a very a basic, I mean, a fundamental definition. So essentially with stale, that just means that um, if a, a dirty page, I mean, contains changes from a uncommitted transaction, you would allow, the system would allow uh, the flush of that, of that dirty page onto the disk, right? So that would just mean still. I mean, with, I mean, in the other uh, opposite, right, you wouldn't allow a dirty page contains, I mean, modifications from uncommitted transaction to be uh, written on the disk, that would be called no still, right? I mean, on the other hand, false and no false, false would mean that um, when a transaction commits, the database system would have to force the buffer pool to flush all the dirty pages that contain um, changes of that from that transaction to be onto disk, right? Before the transaction can commit. And no false is just uh, mean otherwise. So with um, we next talk about this uh, concept of write ahead logging, uh, this uh, technique of write ahead logging. So write ahead logging would be an example of stale and no false, right? You have to be able to you have to have a, a stale and no false powerful policy so that you can implement the, the optimization of a right ahead logging. Essentially, uh, when you, um, uh, when you I mean, when a transaction uh, make changes in the database, it would apply the changes onto a log record and flush that log record onto the disk first before it actually made, made, make, make the modification, all right? And then your buffer pool, your buffer pool uh, could be very flexible if you have right head logging. And then we talk about different uh, logging schemes, right? You can either uh, using the uh, logical logging, right? Essentially just uh, log a single query, but it comes with the uh, cost of like when you try to recover from a crash, you have to re-execute or every single query, right? That could potentially be very costly. Also, or we also talk about the physical logging as well as a physiological logging. Those two are, are kind of similar, right? Essentially, you will actually log the changes, I mean, the pages that contain the changes of that query instead of the query itself. We talk about uh, different checkpoints mechanism, right? The uh, naive checkpoint where you have to uh, flush all the uh, log records as well as all the uh, dirty pages in the buffer pool. But also, import very importantly, we talk about this fuzzy checkpoint. Right, which is like a very important organization would make a checkpoint much more efficient, essentially avoid the need of flushing the pages uh, in the buffer, dirty pages in the buffer pool and avoid the need of blocking other transactions. And also we have a little bit, I mean, since in the class, we actually talk a little bit, in the original class, we discussed an algorithm that is like kind of inconsistent with the standard algorithm. I also have a correction on the fuzzy checkpoint algorithm on Piazza, right? If you haven't, look it up, you, you probably, you should, you should check it out. Right? So make sure that uh, you, you we, are, we are using the, you are, you are understanding or you are referring to the correct, quote unquote, correct variant of algorithm in your homework and the final exam, okay? And then we talk about I mean, errors and, uh, and recovery finally, right, in the concept of crash and recovery. And the most important concept here is the log sequence number, as well as, I mean, how many components of the system right, have their own like notion and their own version of this log sequence number that can coordinate with each other, right? So that the system would know, hey, when would it be safe to um, write a dirty page onto the disk? Where, which number should I flush? What would be the uh, log sequence number in my master record, or in other words, the uh, checkpoint record? And what we need to uh, read 
uh, or what we what log records we need to analyze after a, a crash and then I mean redo and undo the correct thing, right? For all those things, uh, they need a coordination of a log sequence number, right? So that the different components of the database system will know the status of each other and then um, try to bring back the state of the database into a I mean, correct state after a crash, right? So like a many very, very important concept and different. Um, different sub versions of log sequence number maintained at the different parts of the system. Now, we also talk a little bit about this uh, composition log record. Right? Sometimes it would be uh, ignored, but that's also an important thing to help you uh, deal with a scenario where you, where you crash during a recovery, right? just like a recursive crash. So the log sequence uh, record help you in that situation. All right? And then, <laughs> Next, we spend a few lectures to talk about a distributed database system. So for distributed database system, again, we are pretty much only focusing on the uh, high-level concepts, right? We didn't really uh, go into uh, too much detail about, hey, how do we implement a Paxos or Raft algorithm, right? Which is the, we didn't have much time for that I mean, for the first. And second, in this class, we are more focusing on the uh, design decision and trade-offs that you would need to consider, right? When you actually implement a, a distributed database, for example. I mean, because in, in actuality, right, if you are really trying, you're going to build a distributed database, um, you, you are less likely to implement a raft algorithm by yourself, right? You probably would just use a, a existing implementation, but you will need to understand the uh, trade-offs between different uh, choices, right? That's a very important in terms of solving a, a practical problem that you may encounter later. I, this, I, will, I will have a um, few uh, more comments on that in my uh, Final slides or next slides, right? <laughs> so, I mean, in the distributed database system, we first talk about the different system architectures, right? There's a trade-off between uh, shared nothing versus shared disk. I mean, we mentioned shared memory, but that's that's rarely used. I, I don't know any system use use the shared memory architecture, right? Um, and we also talk about shared everything, but that would essentially be a single node database system. We talk about the different uh, replication scheme. Uh, either you use uh, synchronous, unsynchronous, uh, whether you have eventual consistency or strong consistency, right? Whether you use, um, <laughs> sorry, whether you use a, uh, a, a what's called a primary replica or like a, a or all like a primary primary uh, replication replication scheme, right? So those are all the different I mean, trade-offs and design decisions that uh, you had to uh, understand, right? And then next, we talk about the different partition method, right? Either you do a range partition, you do a hash partition, as well as we talk about this concept of consistency hashing, right? which is very, very, very useful if you want to deal with a situation where you have to add or remove nodes in your, in your distributed database system, right? And lastly, uh, we will talk about a few different commit protocols, but uh, I, I would put a little bit of focus on the uh, two-phase commit protocol, because that's uh, more commonly used, right, essentially. Uh, so uh, how do we uh, make sure, how do we implement the two-phase commit to make sure that um, in the system can coordinate a correct result among all the participating nodes if you have a distributed transaction. All right, so any questions about the uh, topics uh, in the uh, later semester? I mean, the, uh, what would be uh, the elements in the final exam and the logistics before we just uh, present a few final comments on building uh, database systems uh, in the real world? Any questions? Yes, please. So in the earlier lectures on durability, we generally combined it deal with no ports right. and no deal with ports. Right. So we didn't really talk about the other two possible combinations. Right. Does anyone actually use them? <sighs> yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. The, the, as far yeah, the question is essentially uh, uh, we, we we talk about I mean still and no force I mean, I mean no no still and force I mean it would, would there be uh, any system that you used uh, different other combinations uh, in the in the buffer management policy right that's the question so as far as I know actually most system would actually uh, use uh, still and no force this is like a majority of the system because most of the system would actually use uh, logging. Right, or especially write head logging and arrays to implement their crash and recovery algorithm that because that's considered uh, more efficient right that's like I, I, it's difficult for me to give you a percentage but most of the most of the system would be used still and no force there's certain system would use the other I mean combination for example you have a shadow paging system right or like copy com, co, copy on write technique right so occasionally I know some system use that combination but that's even that is really rare for other combinations I don't really know yeah yeah I think there's other potentially other questions. No. Okay. Okay. Maybe I missed it. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> 
Lastly, uh, just a few final comments I mean, in terms of uh, implementing or building a, a database system by yourself. Actually, I would say these final comments essentially are this like uh, from my own experience, either I mean, from my own research, as well as I mean, in my own research, I also help building a, 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 a database system right, from, from a scratch. And it was also from a little bit of my um, work experience, right? So, I, but I would say, I don't think those, those experiences are restricted to the heavy system, right? Essentially, if you want to build a, I mean, distributed file system, for example, right? So you are likely um, to encounter a similar uh, questions, right? I mean, so similar experience might also be useful. So <laughs> the uh, most uh, important um, uh, 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 principle, if you will, right? That I think we are trying to build a, I mean, complex system or large system like a database system would be that first you have to be very clear of what would be your goal, would be your constraints, and what resources you have. Right. So what kind of scenario you want to optimize for? You want to buy OLTP, or AP, you want to optimize for read, or, for, or, or optimize for the write, what isolation level you have. Right. So you have to be very, very clear of what would be what do you want to achieve, right? Instead of trying to, I mean, quote unquote, in, in, directly through all the complicated optimization at the system at the beginning. Right. So that would very, very much determine how efficient and how flexible, how maintainable your system architecture is, I mean, whether you know your goal or not. And also, you have to know your constraints, right? So what will be the things you cannot do? Right? Whether there will be a lot of failure in the data center or not. Right? So what will be the limitation that you have? And also very importantly, what resources you may have, right? When you start to, to begin your work, either whether you later on doing research work or I could start your work in a company, likely probably you're just by yourself, right? And later on you may have a few people, but then either, I mean, you're just by yourself or you manage a team of like a few, five, 10 people, you need to know, I mean, how much work either you can do or your team can do, and how do that match your goal and limitation, right? Not only, I mean, you have to um, know all those things, but the general lesson I have is that you have to constantly remind yourself, because right? I mean, when you are trying to uh, implement things and focusing on a specific algorithm or trying to debug a particular things, I mean, your system, it's very easy to forget, right? It's very easy to um, lost yourself in a particular bug or particular optimization and forgot about the overall goal you want to achieve, right? So when I'm trying to build a I mean, database system, I actually remind myself what would be my goal, what would be my constraint, what resources I have, Many, multiple times a day, actually. Not even every day, but multiple times a day so that I don't get lost, right? And uh, another way to say this is that uh, my advisor's advisor, I mean, which is really like the, the, the lead person uh, that developed uh, uh, Postgres CQ, as well as like a Turing Award winner a few years ago, he always liked to use this term of like a high pole in the tent to emphasize the concept that when you are trying to build a real system, you always need to know, hey, what is the most important part in this system? Right? What is the most important goal you want to achieve? And what is, for example, what will be the uh, most inefficient part? Or what is the, the most significant bottleneck in your system? Right? And you focus on that, focus on the most important thing, most important goal, and most important bottleneck or like inefficiency, inefficient component, or optimize on that part instead of trying to optimize everything together, right? So those, this, is, I think, is the most important principle, if you will. The second is a little bit related to that, essentially uh, trying to avoid premature optimization and avoid, try to avoid engineering for non-exist requirements. I mean, as, as a, an engineer, it's very tempting that, hey, to say that, hey, I know an algorithm that can make this component to be faster. Right, but how much faster would it be? Like, would you, would you spend like a, a month to implement an algorithm that makes this component only like five or ten percent faster? And even though this this one particular component is five percent faster, how does that contribute to the overall system? Right, try to avoid uh, this um, premature optimization that potentially spend a lot of effort. But then the benefit, and also makes the system much more complex. But then at the end of the day, the benefit may not be that significant. Again, in terms of achieving your overall goal. And usually, I mean, if there are two like similar uh, solutions, like one solution might be a little bit more efficient than the other. But in general, uh, it would be uh, better to prefer uh, the simpler one, right? And similarly, right? If it's, it's also tempting to say that, hey, what if I already implement, I mean, feature one, two, three? What if, we, what if I implement feature uh, five, six, seven? Would that feature enable lots of different functionalities? I mean, this and that, right? So it's a little bit tempting to do that. But in general, if you don't really have a requirement for a specific functionality and, and feature, just it's, pro it's probably better to avoid to like a pre-engineering for like non-existent requirements, right? 
So that would potentially, in many cases, would make the system more complicated and make it difficult to maintain and extendable uh, and, and extend. So <laughs> that also related to the uh, last points that I want to uh, get across. Essentially, uh, when you are trying to build a, a real system, right? I said to prefer a simple solutions, know your goal, but that that doesn't mean that you should cut corners, right? And try to make uh, shortcuts, right? It's always a bad idea to uh, cut corners, right? To, to uh, try to do a poor error handling, error handling, for example, or, or try to um, use like a very uh, a hacky uh, way to connect different uh, different components of the system together instead of uh, thinking through what the interfaces should be, how do they collaborate, right? In, in general, uh, cutting the corners in system engineering would, uh, or system development would always uh, bite yourself in the end, right? So uh, try to uh, do a system, uh, try to build things uh, rigorously, uh, that would be uh, generally a benefit. But in the meantime, right, similar to the early, earlier points I tried to make, I mean, first of all, there's no correct solution in the database system or, or in computer science in general, right? It's always about different trade-offs, right? Uh, different uh, considerations and what's your goal, what's your constraints, right? You have to always like think about your solution in the context of a uh, specific environment and think about the pros and the cons. And in terms of this uh, avoiding cutting corners, you also have to, um, you, you, you don't really want to um, spend a lot of effort trying to uh, build a uh, things that would be uh, not that beneficial as well, right? So you have to essentially balance the amount of engineering effort you want to spend as well as how extendable the system would be, right? And that also connects to the earlier uh, things I talked about. Essentially, that also you need to evaluate how much resources you have, right? How much engineering you can afford. And then in that case, how much extensibility uh, that you can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can support. And in the case that um, there's a conflict, between a, uh, a uh, solid I mean, engineering solution versus a hacky version of solution, but potentially, right, be a more extendable, potentially being more, more features, it's probably a better idea to prefer the uh, simple solution, but with a, like a well thought design as well as like a solid interface. All right, so these are the lessons uh, that I, I think would be um, useful in terms of in, in, your, in, your, in your work or in your research in the future, no matter whether you go to work at a company or uh, pursue a research career, right? especially if you, when you are starting. Okay, so uh, any questions before we uh, conclude this course for the semester? All right, cool. That's all we have for this semester. Right, thanks a lot for everyone this semester. And then uh, good luck on your final homeworks, exams, or projects, and as well as not only this exam, right, any other exam you may have in the next final week. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Mike onto my fellow. for a mic check, bust it. The fuse all set, then grab a 40. The flim New York and snap his neck. Say nine. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ice Brew on the double.